relationship this week, and um, you guys won't remember it, but when I was a kid, there was a show on public television called Cosmos. Anybody ever seen Cosmos? Uh, anybody ever heard, ever heard of Carl Sagan? Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Sagan was the host, writer of Cosmos. He was a science popularizer. He was, uh, he was an atheist. And the beginning of the show was kind of like Star Trek, you know, space, the final frontier. Uh, the beginning of the show, it had a shot of space, and um, Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all there ever was, and all there ever will be. So he just sort of starts with this grand thing. It was all about space and whatnot, but he makes this big assertion. All there ever was and all there ever will be is space. And in order to talk about what we're going to talk about, we've got to rewind and make as grand of a statement as he's making. He was obviously wrong, but taking a cue from him, um, I want to go back uh, and talk about um, the beginning. So obviously we're going to be in places like John and Genesis tonight, but turn to John for now. Obviously the Gospel of John in the beginning there, John is is riffing on Genesis. It's a sermon on Genesis. He's commenting on creation. And we'll just read uh, a larger section here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse um, 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Who's got King James? Everybody's got King James. <laughs> read, read 18, somebody. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Okay. Uh, I like the King James there, who's in the bosom of the Father. The picture is of intimate fellowship. And so, contrary to Carl Sagan, at the root of all that is, is fellowship. At the bottom of everything, there is relationship. And when we talk about relationship, we must start there. Relationship isn't sort of a, a nice topic we talk about that Christianity can help you out with. Relationship is at the foundation of the universe. Relationship is where everything comes from and where everything is meant to go. Uh, from the fellowship of the Father and the Son in their spirit. And again, I like the um, King James there, uh, who is in the bosom of the Father, who is with the Father, intimate with the Father. That fellowship is the origin of all life. Uh, that is the foundation of everything. And so Carl Sagan is very consistent on his view, but we have to be very consistent on our view and understand that everything comes from perfect fellowship and perfect relationship. So what I want to do is go to a few more scriptures that give us a picture of that, to speak this way, before everything was made, uh, where everything comes from. Um, so the next one I want to go to is Philippians, and I, y'all are memorizing two, three, yes? Okay, I want to go to two. And I want to go to this um, great hymn of Christ that is in Philippians 2. So pay attention to how this speaks of before, uh, origins, where everything comes from. Verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Um, let me just briefly say, you could, you could, there's an argument to be made for striking out the though. 
Or is it the King James now? Verse 6? Uh, verse, yes. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God? I like King James there. All right, DSV has the though. Uh, but take it without the though. He was in the form of God and did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we get this picture of the mind of Christ and the attitude of Christ, his perspective. And it says that he was in the form of God and did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What I want to point out here is that you get this beautiful picture of the relationship of the Father and the Son. Jesus obeys the Father. He obeys the Father in emptying himself. And he obeys the Father in, uh, in humbling himself, in abasing himself. And the Father, for his part, um, exalts him above every name and bestows on him the name that is above every name. And before all that, I think that he says, have this mind in you. When it said, The reason I don't like the though is because I think you might even say because he was in the form of God. The nature of God is self-emptying giving. The Son empties himself in obedience to the Father on our behalf. And the Father you could say empties himself in exalting the Son above every name and giving him a name that is above every name. But starting from the mind of Christ, you have this picture of Jesus didn't need to protect himself. He didn't have to hold on to what was his. He wasn't, a, he wasn't grasping. God is not grasping. God is so full of life that you can't exhaust it. And Jesus was so secure in the Father's love and who he was, that he didn't need to protect. He didn't need to guard. He could entirely entrust himself to the Father. And so, at the very heart of who God is, is self-giving love. There's no inward turn. There's no self-protection. There's no grasping. There is mutual self-giving. And that is at the heart. Uh, that is at the heart of creation. Uh, that is at the foundation of everything. All right, another passage, John, again, 17. What's John 17? The high priestly prayer. Yes, this is Jesus' prayer. After the long discourse with his disciples. And, of course, I imagine you all have touched on 17.3, yes? Okay, well, I'm picking up in 4. We'll start in 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus says, Father, I came and I glorified you. That was my mission. It had nothing to do with me, my reputation, or anything. I was here to glorify you. Now, glorify me in your presence with the glory that we had before the world began. You get there in this passage, and I encourage you to read this passage this week. You get... This is one rare glance, glance, glance in Scripture. Did I say it again? No. This rare glimpse in Scripture of this relationship between Father and Son and this rare glimpse of before creation. And he says, Father, I want them to be with me and see the glory that you gave me before the world began. And so again, it's this very beautiful picture of perfect fellowship, mutual giving, mutual glorifying. The Father in His own way glorifying the Son, and the Son in His own way glorifying the Father. Um, and then one last scripture on this point is in 1 John. Um, 1 John, chapter 1. Once again, John goes back to Genesis. That which was from the beginning, 
that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, there's that eternal life language again, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so John says, listen, I saw it. I touched it. I walked with him. I have seen the life manifest from the Father, and I have fellowship with him. And we, he says we, whoever he's writing with and from, he says, we have fellowship now with the Father and with his Son. That fellowship that is the foundation of all of life has, was made manifest. And we have seen it and we bear witness to it. And now we're writing to you that you may share it with us and that you may enter into it with us. <clears throat> we're going to come back to 1 John later in the week. Um, but that is the nature of fellowship. It is mutually glorifying, mutually serving, and it overflows to others. John has tasted it. He has seen it. He is participating in fellowship with the Father and the Son. He says, I'm writing this so that you can participate with us in this. Because we have touched on that life and that fellowship that is at the foundation of everything. And we want you to know it too. Now, of course, later in 1 John, John says God is love. And it's worth um, just real briefly giving a brief definition of love. God is love. Um among other things, means that the Father wills what is good for the Son. And the Son wills what is good for the Father. And if I love someone, I will, meaning I choose and commit myself to what is good for them. Now it's important to note that for a lot of people, to love someone means to affirm what they want. Right? And what they plan. Um, but just like God didn't affirm what we wanted because he knew it was destructive, uh, love doesn't always mean I affirm what you want. It, may, it might mean I oppose what you want because I love you. Now with the Father and the Son, there's no taint of sin. There's no taint of an inward turn. There's no taint of self-defense. And so it is this beautiful life of mutual self-giving. But when sin enters into the picture... And God comes and wills what is best for his creatures. The end result often, if they, can't, if they will not trust him, is them killing him and crucifying him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What love looks like among the sinful is the cross. And it will always be that way until the end. Um, but that first point, to so just bring us back, is the foundation of everything is fellowship. Where the universe is going is fellowship. Where the universe came from is fellowship. So going back to the creation of man, and this all is before the creation of mankind. Um, we were created for that fellowship. Mankind was created with a destiny to share in that fellowship. Um, and let me say it this way. We enter a fellowship that is before us. So just think about that at the biological level. Before you ever were, there's a fellowship, namely your mother and father. A joint participation. And you were created and you enter into a community that was there before you. But creation itself, the creation of Adam and Eve itself, let us make man in our image, was an outflowing of God's life. And a creation of mankind so that they could participate with God in his life. And join him in who he was and what he was doing. And the same is true when you get saved. When a person becomes a Christian... They join a fellowship that existed before them, namely the church, right? God created us to participate with him. We rebel. Jesus redeems us, and he puts together a fellowship that is meant to reflect the fellowship of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we are saved, we join that fellowship. We are joining into that. We are participating in that. And one of the things that we're going to hit on this week is appreciating how much um, how much of your life is from others? How much there is fellowship before you that is from others? I mean, everything from your 
genes, to the provision of your life, to the very language you speak. All right? There's so much about us that comes from others. Um, so that we are created for others. And we are created to need others. In fact, one of the things I want to say is that a person uh, lives from others and for others. We are created dependent on one another. Um, so Adam and Eve were created to join into this fellowship. They were created to um, join the party, if you will. Um, they were created to be indwelt by the Spirit of God. Um, God made man, he fashions him, he breathes in him the breath of life. Um, but then as we see the story of the Old Testament unfold, uh, mankind dies apart from God's presence. And then in Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones, I assume everybody knows that uh, in Ezekiel, that picture of the Valley of Dry Bones, God's breath breathes upon this, this army and they become, a, they become living, they become alive. And then when Jesus, in the Gospel of John, um, he sees his disciples and he breathes on them. He says, receive the breath of life. And it's that image of back to Genesis when God originally breathed into Adam the breath of life. And I want you to consider how intimate that is. It's like mouth to mouth. It's very, it, it is, to breathe in somebody the breath of life is like mouth to mouth. And Jesus breathes on the disciples. So they were created to be indwelt by the presence of God. They were created for God's, for, to walk in intimacy with God. Uh, they were created in the image of God. Male and female created he them. God builds into our biology, into our social life, two creatures that are different from one another, that are called to live together and to cleave to one another and to be a living image together of the nature and character of God, mutual self-giving. We're going to talk about marriage again later in the week, but marriage is an icon of the nature of God. And when marriage breaks down, it's an icon of hell. It's an image, a picture of hell. But when it works right, when there is really mutual self-giving uh, that's rooted in the character of God, it's heaven on earth. And then Adam and Eve were created to participate with what God was doing. Look, God created the world. He makes the world. And on the sixth day, he makes mankind. And on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath, where God is able to say, Adam, Eve, look at what I've made. I love it. Look at it. God delighted in it. He says, Adam, I want you to keep it and guard it. I want you to multiply it. I want you to fill the earth. And I want you to beautify it. I want you to figure out what I've made and... and Unlock the potential of what I've made, and I want you to walk with me in doing it. I want you to participate with me in doing it, and I want you to fill the earth with my image, fellowship. I want you to fill the earth with the image of yourself, which is the image of me. And so we were created for that fellowship. We were created to participate with God, to have his presence in us, to participate in that life. And then, of course, we know what happens. Genesis chapter 3. And I'm kind of glad that y'all talked about Genesis, um, because I think every, we've got to go back there for everything. And I want to talk again briefly about the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree of the gar uh, any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan is trying to do two things, and he succeeds in doing two things. One, he succeeds in planting the suggestion in Eve's mind that God cannot be trusted, that God's desire for them is not good. That he is keeping them out of something good. That he is a kind of a killjoy that is reserving the best for himself. And Eve buys into this and begins to think that way herself. Begins to think the way that Satan is saying God thinks. And then beyond that, she begins to have this inward turn. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And so, 
Eve believes this idea that God doesn't have the best in mind. And then she also says, well, then I need to look out for number one and figure out what's best for me myself. And she partakes of the fruit and persuades her husband to partake of the fruit. And that is at the root of the break of fellowship. And the rest of Genesis up till chapter 12 is a picture of the consequences. Uh, and I would encourage you also to read Genesis 3 through 11. And I'm just going to briefly mention a few things with a view toward the consequences of separation from that fellowship. The consequences of saying, God's not out for my best. So, um, so first of all, obviously we get the curse, uh, the curses. And ultimately, Adam and Eve, they are separated from God. So their relationship with God is now fraught, is now broken, is now, um, is now in need of, of being fixed. Uh, but their relationship from one another is broken. All right? They have gone from the default of self-giving love to, I cannot trust that person, I better look out for myself. I cannot trust God, I better look out for myself. I cannot trust my husband, I better look out for myself. I cannot trust my wife, I better look out for myself. Chapter 4, we get Cain and Abel. So the first murder takes place. The first jealousy, right? Jesus is not jealous of the Father. He's not jealous of the Father being the Father at all. He delights in the Father being the Father in every way that's different from Him. <clears throat> Nor is the Father jealous of the Son. But Cain is jealous of Abel, and we get the first martyr. We get the first person trying to be faithful to God murdered uh, by his brother. In chapter, a little bit later in chapter 4, we get the origin of gangster rap. Um, Lamech. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 19 of chapter 4. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents, yada, yada, yada. Um, verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. And by the way, this is set off his poetry, right? This is a, it's, it's, a, it's rap. <laughs> Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wronging, wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. So we get, <clears throat> we get lust, we get domineering, we get revenge. Um, in chapter six, we get the um, whatever this is <coughs> when um, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took them as their as them as or, excuse me. They took as their wives as many as, wait, hmm. <laughs> and they took as their wives any they chose. Um, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old, who were men of renown. I will not solve this, but most people will point out that what's going on is a break of God's order. It's a rebellion against God's order, whatever it is. Okay, whether you think it's angels or whether you, whatever, it's, it's a break of God's order. Then you get the flood, verse 5, God says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Consider that statement. We read it again. The wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. All this from, I cannot trust God, I'd better look out for myself. And so God judges the earth, he brings the flood. Noah gets off the ark, he is to be fruitful and multiply, and then we have the incident with the vine, and him getting drunk, and the whole scene with his sons, which is, you know, initially it's promising, but that's not exactly promising. And then we have the Tower of Babel, and people, I think, often miss the point of the Tower of Babel, Verse 4 of chapter 11, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. I think everybody thinks it's all about trying to get to heaven with this tower. I don't think that's the point. The next part is the point. Let us make a name for ourselves. 
Most human activity since then, apart from God, has been about making a name for themselves, whether it's nations or individuals. What is name? Name is identity. I am not going to trust God. I'm not going to relate to Him. I'm not going to let Him tell me who I am. I'm going to make a name for myself, whether it's the tallest skyscraper in the world or the funniest guy or the prettiest girl or the most athletic guy or whatever it might be or the the most uh, quirky guy or whatever. We are endlessly trying to make who we are apart from God. That's the, that is the primary sin of the Tower of Babel. Now, I'm sure this will come up some this summer. summer. Unity is good, but there are bad kinds of unity, and this is a bad kind of unity, right? Human, humanity, in independence of God, can get together and accomplish quite a bit. God knows it. And this is his judgment on that unity. All right? Um, so, Genesis 3 through 11 gives us a wonderful picture, not a wonderful picture, but a, a stark picture of um, mankind apart from God. And no, it is not one of relational harmon harmony in a good way at all. It is unity and defiance of God. It is domination of one another. It is mistrust of one another. It is jealousy. Uh, I think Titus has a very um, succinct one verse picture uh, in Titus 3, 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. This is a fantastic picture of the relational state of mankind, um, isolated and separated from God. And so, um, how many people have read The Great Divorce? Um, you know my red bag, my red craftsman bag? I left it in there. Can you bring it? It's, there's a green chair. Green chair. My green jacket. See it? <laughs> um, so in The Great Divorce, there's a, this is a sort of a parable C.S. Lewis tells uh, of people who are in hell getting to take a visit to heaven. And he doesn't mean it literally, but he gives a great picture, I think, of human relationships um, outside the garden, human relationships apart from God. And I wanted to read a little bit of it. So the the narrator finds himself in this city, which is you find out is supposed to be sort of a picture of hell. And um, he notices it's this very large, bleak city, and, but it seems to be sort of partially abandoned. Um, and he's talking to another spirit that, um, that describes it to him. The trouble is they're so quarrelsome. As soon as anyone arrives, he, sets, he settles in some street. Before he's been there 24 hours, he quarrels with his neighbor. Before the week is over, he's quarreled so badly that he decides to move. Very likely, he finds the next street empty because all the people there have quarreled with their neighbors and moved. If so, he settles in. If by any chance the street is full, he goes further. But even if he stays, it makes no odds. He's sure to have another quarrel pretty soon, and then he'll move on again. Finally, he'll move right out to the edge of the town and build a new house. You see, it's easy here. You've only got to think of house, and there it is. So it gives this picture of this city that extends for millions of miles because people quarrel and they continue to move apart from one another. And I think it's a very great picture of relationship apart from God. Broken marriages, broken relationships, people come to odds, they quarrel, and they separate. Uh, and that was never God's intention. It was never what God designed. Um, in fact, God designed it such that the person that maybe you would be the most quarrelsome with, for whatever reason, what God intends is to turn you into the kind of the person that would say, when you got to heaven, God, can I serve them for 10,000 years? Can I be their servant and, and wash their feet for 10,000 years and do whatever they need? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And a good test of where you are in relationship is what happens like this when you get thrust together, when you get when you get put in tight spaces. I call it the grace of tight spaces. Mm -hmm. Marriage is a tight space. Certain kinds of relationship are a tight space. And they reveal the things that are off about us in terms of relationship. Um, one last verse that I want to go to. 
Proverbs 18.1. King James won't help you here. Um, this is one place where I disagree with King James. ESV. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. It's a very powerful verse. Um, ask yourself what you're doing when you hide. That's the picture of the person who isolates himself. Ask yourself what you're doing when you withdraw or you hide from fellowship or relationship. Very often, it's no good. All right, the proverb is suggesting when I isolate, when I pull away from relationship, when I'm trying to get away, uh, probably I'm back where Eve was. I got something I'm craving, and it looks good, and I want it, and I don't want anybody to stop me. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, and so I think this is a great sort of gloss on Genesis and what happened there. Um, and a great picture of hell. You know, I believe, um, I believe that there will be torment in hell, but I think the chief nature of it is isolation from others. And the chief, one of the chief natures of hell is that God is there and we are there with others. And God is trying to do inside of us. He is trying to create in us the kind of hearts um, that can live in heaven. Heaven is a place where the culture of the place is everybody there wills the best for everyone else there. And let me say something very briefly about will. Will is not passive. Okay? Not, probably nobody in here would say, uh, I wish bad on anybody. But indifference is a form of hatred. Does that make sense? A lot of Christians are not guilty of malice, active will for somebody's, um, somebody's, you know, the worst for somebody. But indifference is a form of hatred. Cain was indicted by his own words. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Are you responsible for your brother? Yes. And so keep in mind, will is an active, outgoing, commitment to the good of another. Everybody understand that? Just, again, consider Jesus' active, outgoing commitment to our good. And that's what it should look like for one another. Which is why Paul says, have this mind in you which, was yours in, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Because this is the very attitude and the way of life of Jesus himself. He goes out and leaves behind what is his for the sake of others. That they might to bring the best to them. So when we become Christians, the, the scripture is full of these wonderful images. Um, we are adopted as children into a family. We come into a fellowship that was there before us. And what we're going to talk about this week primarily is, um, is learning the culture of that family. Um, Y'all don't, how many people know what the Waltons was? You ever watched reruns of the Waltons? So the Waltons was this uh, story or this TV show about a family, big family. I don't remember where they lived. Anybody remember where they lived? North somewhere. Um, and it was during the Depression. They were very poor and they loved one another. And there's this great fellowship. And there's this scene when John Boy, uh, one of the, the oldest sons of the family, finds a deaf girl or a mute girl. And he brings her into the family, sort of adopts her. And she's obnoxious. She can't communicate. Um, she can't get along. She's rude at the table. And John Boy undertakes to teach her sign language and to teach her to be able to communicate and to teach her how a family lives and the culture of the family. And that is what, that is what relationships in the body of Christ are about. We are getting acculturated to the culture of heaven. This is, a, this is our Father's house. We come to his table and, uh, and we are called together to learn to live and eat together at our Father's table. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna be in Ephesians some. Uh, let me read one particular scripture in Ephesians. It's two eighteen. For through him, now this is a, one of the most compact scriptures. So stick with me. For through him, him is Christ. We both that is Jew and Gentile, 
And by the way, for Paul here, Jew and Gentile represents the divisions among mankind. All right, Paul will say, you know, in Galatians, in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile. Right? Um, those are all the typical differentiations in, in the human race. Right? There's the slave and there's the master. Uh, there's men and women. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Uh, there's, um, and these are sort of the paradigmatic divisions. But the way you can apply it is anybody with whom you have division with. Okay? Any Christian that you don't like. And by the way, I think it's important to be honest when we don't like people. I don't think you necessarily have to tell them you don't like them. <laughs> but you have to be honest with yourself and say, well, God, it looks like I don't like them. Help me. Mm -hmm. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. um, it's, really, it's, it's really good to be honest with yourself and God. So at any rate, he says, for through him, Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, or me and this person that I don't like, have access in one spirit to the Father. There's a number of things I would point out about this. Uh, one is that it speaks of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's through Christ, in the Spirit, we both have access. I'm not left out, but nor is that person that I might be prone to want to leave out. We are there together. When I join the family, I might be sat down next to somebody I don't like. But guess what? We both have access to the Father together. And we are called, I am called together to learn how to be delighted that they have that access. And be delighted that I'm called to sit together with them. Uh, be delighted that I'm called to be at the same table with them. Let me read a quote. Salvation is communion with God and human beings. It is communion with God and human beings. John will make it pretty clear those who have a wonderful relationship with Jesus and not so great with the people in the concrete body that they're called to walk in are fooling themselves. Okay? Salvation, as it unfolds in our life, includes the continually improving relationships that we would have with one another. Does that make sense? Um, said another way, relationship is not a means, but an end. The goal of human life is fellowship. And that fellowship starts now. Just like it talks about, um, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ and now ascend. That starts now. That fellowship, that knowledge of God and his son Jesus Christ starts now. You have eternal life beginning now if you have that fellowship. Uh, Dallas Willard died recently. Um, you didn't know that? He died a couple weeks ago. Um, and one of the things he said before he died, in the years before he died, is he said, when I die, I expect it to take a while for me to notice. Mm -hmm. The reason being because he said, I, I walk in fellowship with the Father and the Son. And it increases every day. And when I die, I expect it to increase, but I expect it to take a while for me to go, oh yeah, I died. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The same should be true in our relationships in the body. Our fellowship should increase. Our participation together. Me becoming increasingly someone who wills the good for the other, regardless of what they will for me, um, should increase more and more. Um, one last thing I want to say is, well, it's not the last thing. Um, one last thing about our calling. Your relationships in the body of Christ are meant to give others a window into the life of heaven. Um, we won't arrive at heaven, we won't arrive at perfection of relationship, but our relationship could, should continually improve. And they should give the world glimpses of heaven. Yeah. By this will men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another by your steadfast commitment to the good of one another. Mm -hmm. That is what will show the world heaven. Um, so what I'd like to end with um, is I want to mention something about Ephesians. And actually, probably tomorrow and maybe tonight, I would like us to um, 
Read Ephesians 1 through 3. Um, Ephesians 1 through 3, among other things, speaks of what God has done to reconcile us to himself and us to one another. All right, and it does this in it does this in John in the beginning kinds of language. Does everybody know what I mean? It's cosmic. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about Ephesians. It's cosmic. I mean, it's huge. And then it goes down and talks about husbands and wives and very mundane things. Right? But that's the point. Because it is about how God has put man back together with God and man back together with man. And it is about how all of that... Um, how all of that comes together. And so 1 through 3 is about that, and then at 4 it takes a turn. And I want to just look at where it takes the turn. And then, again, we'll pick up with it tomorrow. And I think, again, before we start tomorrow, we'll read through 1 through 3 aloud together. Mm -hmm. right? um, so maybe I'll begin in 3.14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that you can't know. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now he takes his turn. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk, worthy, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What we want to talk about this week is learning to walk worthy of that calling. The calling of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The fellowship from which all of life sprang. The fellowship from which the cross sprang to reconcile us to God. He has called us by name to himself. He has called us to that fellowship. And he has called us to walk in a way that is worthy of that fellowship. Um... Eugene Peterson says there's a word picture behind the Greek word there, axios, to walk worthy. He says it's the old balancing scales. Remember the balancing scales? Uh, when you would do a transaction, you would buy, say, a pound of something, and you would have a pound of the flour on the one side and a, a pound weight on the other side, and there was the weight that was the standard, and on the other side was the equal weight of flour, and it was worthy. It would correspond to it. What is the relational life together that corresponds to the calling you have received in Christ Jesus? Does that make sense? There is the cross of Christ and his resurrection from the dead and his being seated at the right hand ever to intercede for us. What is the relational life we're called to live together that is worthy of that? That's a high order, isn't it? Now, the scripture says he's able to do far more than we ask or imagine. But what I want to put on us is a sense that our relationships with one another, with your parents, with your friends, um, with future spouses, uh, they can correspond to the cross. They can be a worthy, they can be a worthy partner to the cross and display the character of God, and display the fellowship that was from the beginning. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do this week um, is unfold what it means to walk that worthy walk. Uh, it's worth reading because you can't start with Ephesians and stop. Um, I'll just read a little bit more. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, let me comment on that. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. If another person is a Christian, they have the Holy Spirit. God has in Christ made a bond of peace between you. We don't have to create it. 
we have to guard it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. we, that's the beautiful thing. We can't create it. Jesus has done it with his blood and the sending of the Holy Spirit. What we have to do is guard it. So anytime you have conflict, and I'm getting way ahead of myself, you have to start with, we, uh, we, we have a bond of unity in the Spirit. And our job here, as we figure out our differences, is to protect and guard this bond. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to stop there because there's a lot more to do. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Billy, she, Karen and I were commenting, Billy can take one topic and, and go at it a thousand angles. I'm ADD, and I say everything I've got to say in one sermon, and then I'm done. Uh, so I'm going to stop. Um, let me get questions or comments. Um, or Dan, do you, do you want to MC? Or? Okay. Questions?